Five and three, two, one. Hey, welcome to Spark Fun Live. My name is Mike. I'm this Tony. This is my friend Tony. <laughs> Party on Tony. Party on Mike. All right, today we are going to show you how to build something that we made as a prank a little bit, a little while ago uh, called the Elevator TARDIS. Um, if you're familiar with uh, the British science fiction series Doctor Who, you'll know that the TARDIS is his time and space machine, and it makes this really unique grinding noise that people who've seen the show kind of know by heart. So what we made is a box that has an accelerometer in it and an audio player, and when it senses the acceleration of the elevator, it starts playing. And this will probably go off a few times, so we, we may shut it off at some point. Um, let's see. Um, these guys have a clip of what these shenanigans look like in the elevator, so let's take a look at that. Um, While we're going through this, if you guys have any questions along the way, uh, please feel free to post those in the YouTube comments. I'm hanging out in the chat room, so I can try and answer those for, uh, for you. Um, otherwise, let's get started, Mike. Cool. If you go, well, actually, okay. <laughs> yeah. if you look down below here on the YouTube description, you'll find a wish list of the parts at sparkfun.com, and I think Tony will bring that up as well. Uh, it's it's a you know whole bunch of little little bits and pieces, but the heart of it is the Lilypad MP3 player. Um, this is something out of the Lilypad line that's usually meant for being uh, put in clothing. You you can sew it into clothing and make like MP3 hoodies and stuff like that. Uh, but we're using it for this project because it basically has everything you need all on one board. It's got a SD card socket. Try the, the close up. It's got an SD card socket, um, an Atmega, so it's fully Arduino compatible, an MP3 decoder chip, and actually a stereo audio amplifier as well. So this pretty much has everything you need on it. Um, now, so you wouldn't have to see me soldering just for hours and hours on things, uh, I went ahead and soldered a bunch of headers onto this. And let's see, I can grab that. If you can bring up the... Uh, the GitHub repository? Yeah. So uh, right now we've got the website pulled up here for the wish list. It's on sparkfun.com slash wish list slash 88135. So you guys can see all the parts that we're using here. Um, so that's all in there. And you can just add that to your card if you want, if you're watching this later on at home. And then we're also going to be using all the code from our GitHub repository, uh, which is at uh, github.com slash sparkfun slash elevator underscore TARDIS. So, and on here we've got uh, the audio files that we're using for this project, the documentation, the software that we're going to, the Arduino code that we're going to be using. So, um, if you guys are using this at home and you don't have a GitHub account, you can always just hit this nice little download zip button right there and that'll download the file for you. So if you are doing that, why don't you download that now and start uh, getting it unzipped and copied over to your desktop. Sweet. Um, OK, cool. The, one of the first things in the repo is uh, this readme file. It's just down at the bottom here. And if you scroll down a little bit, uh, one of the first images you'll see is a big picture of where we're going to put our headers. We don't need all the headers on this thing, um, but, but there's quite a few we do need. So what you do is you take, um, I guess I don't have it in here, but we've got uh, header, breakaway header sticks, 
and you break those apart and you just stick them in the little holes and solder them in there. And you can click there to focus. Oh, good to know. Yeah. And so you can see these little posts sticking up. Those are all the things we soldered onto this board to kind of do our connections to it. Um, if we go back to the computer, you can see that um, we're hooking up, we're making connections for two speakers, the right speaker and the left speaker, and each of those has a plus and a minus. Um, the cool thing about the Lilypad MP3 player is that it's got all these ports around the outside, and some of them are dual purpose. Uh, we've routed the I squared C ports to two of these so we can use them to talk to our accelerometer board. Um, there's a 3.3 output we can use for an accelerometer board along with the ground. Um, we're going to use the battery plus and minus in order to drive the LEDs. Um, if you saw the box up front, you saw that the lights are pretty bright. Those are brighter than usually a logic port can provide. Uh, so we're going to use a little uh, MOSFET to drive those. And we've got a couple other ones. Um, D10 we're using to actually pulse the LEDs. We'll talk more about that later. And the last one, um, D3, we're not using it right now. But a really cool upgrade to this project is to make it sleep so that it can stay quiet for long times. And when it's bumped, it wakes up. And that saves the battery life. The one we're going to show you today just kind of stays on all the time just to make it simple so that we can explain it to you. But um, that, that's a good upgrade to do. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, making connections. I've got the full one. Sweet. Yeah. So Mike's going to pull up uh, the step-by-step -step pictures here as we're going through it. Mm -hmm. uh, what you guys have up there right now is the full connection, so the final version of what he's going to be putting together here. Um, so you can, that's also included in the GitHub repository, so if you're looking at this later on, you can always take a look at it. <laughs> he's traveling a lot today. <laughs> you can always take a look at this at home, so. All right. OK. Um, we're going to build this using um, these jumper wires. You can really build it however you want. If you want to solder things from point to point, you can do that. Um, we kind of like these because it, it makes it really easy and quick to assemble stuff. We do these for prototypes all the time around here. So I'm just going to look over at my diagram and see that uh, I'll grab a red one because we usually use that for power. Plug that into the 3.3 volt line, and then over to the 3.3 volt line on the accelerometer. Um, I'll do the same thing for the ground, since those go in pairs. By the way, sorry for starting a little late, guys. We had technical difficulties, but we finally worked them out. Um, now we're going to do the I squared C lines. These share trigger pins on the MP3 board. OK, sure. Um, let's see. So SDA goes to SDA. So Mike, why are you using an accelerometer for this? Ah, that's a really good question. <laughs> I'll try to come up with a really good answer. <laughs> Well, why an accelerometer versus another sensor such as a gyroscope or ah, a magnetometer gotcha. or? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, let me, let's see, let me see if I can bring up a picture here. I've got Spark fun. Um, actually, I'll go to YouTube. The short story is that we wanted to have something in the elevator that would play noise when the elevator is moving up and down. What we didn't want was to actually hack into the elevator. That's really not good. Um, and our facilities managers would not appreciate that. They right. yell at us when we start hacking into the building infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly Then right. there's meetings and red tape, and yeah. it just gets really messy. And Mike gets fired and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Well, bad things. We don't want any of that. Yeah. But it occurred to us that we could use an accelerometer to actually sense the elevator moving up and down. That way we can make an entirely self-contained box that runs on battery power even, that doesn't need to be hooked into the elevator at all, doesn't need to read the buttons or anything like that, and um, yet it could still sense when the elevator is moving up and down and uh, start the noise up. 
So let's see, I'm gonna bring Well, Mike's up. looking for that. Uh, somebody actually just brought this up in the comments. We are actually looking, um, looking for a new supplier for our speakers. So in case you guys were looking at the wish list <laughs> and had a problem ordering those, uh, we do understand and we're sorry for that, any trouble that might have caused. Right. Um, but just keep in mind, um, if you guys see again on the lily pad board here, um, there's that itty bitty little, there's a microphone jack on there, if I can get the camera to focus. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can always use computer speakers. It'll be a little bit, might not be quite as loud, um, but you can also hack some speakers from an old radio yeah. or I, Mike had a whole box of speakers. I've got a whole box of here. speakers right back here. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll pull that out later and, and show you what I found in the trash can. Yeah. Um, let's see, if we can look at the computer real quick, going back to the elevator question and why we're using accelerometer. Um, before I did the project, I just stuck an accelerometer on the floor of the elevator and data logged it, which is a really good way to sort of check out in advance how things kind of work out. And if you look at this chart, you'll see that we're reading the acceleration, which is the blue line. When the elevator starts up, we get a spike going down. That's because the elevator is moving down and you have a <laughs> A change in forces. Change in forces, yeah, right. You're, so. you're moving down, so the force of gravity will actually be a little bit less on you while the elevator is accelerating. Then when the elevator is running steady, moving down at a constant rate, the acceleration goes back to zero. Then when the, acceler when the elevator stops, it, you actually decelerate, and the accelerometer can me measure that too. So you can see that y we can actually figure these things out by looking at the output of the accelerometer. Uh, same sort of thing happens if you go in reverse. When the elevator is moving up, you get a great big spike. When it starts moving up, then it's constant and the acceleration is close to zero. It's just kind of noisy. And then when it stops, we get another bump of acceleration in the opposite direction. And uh, just looking at this graph, you can see that, you know, if you do a little bit of math and sort of take some readings and see if you can see these spikes outside the noise, then you can sense when the elevator is starting and stopping. All right. So does that answer your question? That does answer my question. <laughs> that answers my question. Great. Um, and for those of you at home who, you know, if Mike's explanation about the accelerometers didn't really get it all for you, yeah, um, we do have uh, a tutorial on our learn.sparkfun website. Um, mm -hmm. I've got that pulled up on my computer here. Uh, just ex basics of accelerometers. So um, as you know, you can take a look at that while Mike's going through and hooking up the wires. Um, but basically, again, what he was saying is that these sensors measure the change in velocity. So, you know, as you're decelerating in the elevator coming to a stop, that's a change in your velocity from the moving speed of the elevator to the stopped speed, which is zero. So that's where you're getting those spikes on there. And uh, it goes into a little bit of the math on here. The math can get a little more complicated, but there's a lot of fun uh, demo programs out there that do uh, data processing and stuff like that for you guys as well, so. Cool. All right. All right. Um, the next chart I have shows the speakers being plugged in, but let's skip ahead a little bit. Because because we don't have good speakers and I got a trash bag full of speakers here, I want to go through that later when we actually have it making some noise. Um, next thing we're going to do is hook up the LEDs. And because these LEDs are kind of high powered ones, uh, we can't just run them off of a normal Arduino port. So what we're gonna use is this cool little board that uh, Nate actually designed um, called the, the Power Control Kit. And the Power Control Kit has a great big transistor on it called a MOSFET. And what a transistor does is it switches larger amounts of current for you. It's kind of like a relay, if you know what that is. Um, so basically you can put a small control voltage into the MOSFET saying, turn on please. And the MOSFET turns on like this giant switch clunk and then it lets all the current flow that you need to, to have things run. And I can't remember exactly, I think this one's good up to four amps or something ridiculous. We're not gonna use nearly that much. We'll use maybe a couple hundred milliamps. Um, but we're gonna use that to control the, uh, these LEDs. So I'll go back to my diagram and go ahead and plug that in. Um, oh, real quick. Uh, this comes with, uh, let's see, I don't have them up here. This actually comes with uh, screw terminals, uh, blue screw terminals, but I went ahead and put um, 0.1 inch headers in there just so we could continue using the, the same uh, hookup lines that we've been using for everything else. Uh, again, you, you can use whatever you're comfortable with. 
if, if you like the screw terminals, you can just cut and strip one of these, these jumper wires and just stick it in there or solder directly to the board or whatever you like. It's your stuff. Um, so let's see, I'm going to go ahead and there is a C which stands for the control. So I'll plug that in and on my chart that goes down to this little guy right here in the middle of the board. Um, then we have plus and minus and we're going to run those straight to the battery voltage. Um, a lot of our boards that have uh, JST connectors to plug a battery Oops. into them. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> this camera is not playing nice with me. This is why I'm in engineering, <laughs> folks, not in Marcom. <laughs> oh, come on. So a lot of our boards that have JST connectors to plug a battery into them, we'll also put a little power header right next to it so that if you do want to, you know, bypass the connector, or, or I'm moving it all over and not helping you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we put a little header there and um, I soldered some, some 0.1 inch headers into it so that we can plug everything in. And so I will plug our control board into the minus and the plus which are labeled on the board. Always double check against those. And for those of you who are new, um, for most of you this will probably be old hat, but we tend to use red for the positive side and black for the ground side. It's just kind of a universal color code. More or less everything else you can kind of use whatever colors you want, but for those two we we, we try to stick to those. It, it that doesn't mean, easier. though, that you should always just blindly trust uh, <laughs> colors instead of checking the data sheet. Um, yeah. Sometimes we have had suppliers switch that on us, which leads to a lot of confusion and then blown up boards and magic yep. smoke escaping, and then the doctor can't go anywhere. So <laughs> it's just really unfortunate. That's absolutely true. OK, so on the other side of this, we've got our LEDs. And I'm using four of them. You could use more or less or, or whatever you want. And another thing I'll mention is, you know, right now we're building a TARDIS that plays the TARDIS noise from Doctor Who. But you could really have this do whatever you wanted. If you wanted to play a scary noise or, you know, um, you know, people could do all kinds of things with an accelerometer. Yeah. I'm, uh Accelerometers, let's see, what are some of the applications? Mike here actually built, a while ago, he built me a tracking box for when I went snowboarding, so I could <laughs> uh, just throw it in my backpack while I was snowboarding, and it would track um, my speeds as I was going down the runs, mm -hmm. how quickly I was yeah. uh, traversing different routes and stuff like that, so that was pretty neat. Um, we've had people use them in hot air balloon projects, so they can see the data as far as, you know, when the balloon pops and it suddenly starts dropping yeah. back to Earth. Um, One of our customers who has, who's on our mural out here in the hallway was a base jumper and wanted to know what kind of force mm -hmm. their body experiences when, they, when they're falling and pull that, pulling that chute and all of a sudden they stop. And what, yeah. what do they, you, you give the tours, what, what is the G-force? It's like in oh, being in a I car accident or something yeah, like that? Yeah, something like that. So it's, it's pretty vicious. So <laughs> accelerometers are fun like that. Um, we've got a bunch of our um, people, are, I think some of our engineers are working on a car actually for AVC, which is coming up, and people have been trying to get some accelerometers into those just so they can see if their robots happen to crash, how badly they crash. Right. Um, but of course, not that we want anyone's robots to crash. <laughs> Unless it's a spectacular explosion, so right. um, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, so we've got all these LEDs, and if you look at the diagram on my computer, you, you see that um, these LEDs are hooked up to things that kind of go from one wire to many wires, like a Y. And you know, the normal jumper wires aren't like that; they just go from one thing to another. So, how do you do something like that? And the answer is you cut them <laughs> and make a Y. So what I did was I took four, actually five wires, I cut four of them, um, kind of twisted that together and soldered the fifth one on. And one other thing in here is that I put a resistor in here. 
And usually when you have LEDs running off of a current source, you want to have some sort of resistor in there to slow down the current and not burn out the LED. Mm -hmm. Now these are really bright LEDs and they use a lot of current, so this resistor is really small. And in fact, you might be able to get away with not using it at all. But uh, we, we try to let, use those when we can. Um, so as, as part of this pigtail, I, I put the resistor in there that goes to all the LEDs. And that is a 47 ohm resistor. Um, these LEDs can run at up to, I think, 80 milliamps, our, our product page says. And I'm not quite running in that high because uh, they're plenty bright at less than that. Um, so I think we could go down to like a 20, 20 ohm fuse, 20, 20 ohm fuse, 20 ohm resistor. But uh, we didn't have a 20 ohm resistor <laughs> in our resistor kit. We've got uh, 10 and then it goes up to 47. So I just grabbed the 47, which means these are slightly less bright than they could be, but they're still plenty bright, so don't worry about that. So Mike, you have those uh, resistor connections to the wires there exposed. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's or? not great. Um, I mean, you could sort of trust that when these things are in your box that they'll sort of stay apart and won't short against each other, but uh, Murphy's Law being what it is, chances are sooner or later these things will touch each other. Uh, one of the things we like to do about that is use heat shrink. Um, if you've never seen heat shrink before, it's this really cool stuff. It comes in all kinds of different sizes. And what heat shrink is, is it's a weird type of plastic tube that shrinks about half of its diameter when you apply heat to it. There's different colors and sizes. Of course, everything we have is red and black, so it's a little hard to see. <laughs> um, we've got some white. Ooh, I'm going to use the white one. Yeah, there you go. Let's and see. then we've got some blue, too. Um, so as you can, you guys can kind of see on the camera there, uh, we got all these different sizes. So usually if you buy heat shrink packs, it comes with a bunch of different um, mm -hmm. yeah. sizes so you can pick the right one for your project. So, yeah. so we'll go ahead and uh, seal up this connection with the heat shrink. So the first thing I will do is I will sort of judge how, how long it needs to be. Uh, heat shrink will sl shrink slightly in its length, but most of the shrinking happens across its diameter. So really we just kind of need to go across that. So I will cut this about like that. Um, you also want to pick a, pick a piece of heat shrink that is big enough so you can actually get it over the connection. Um, if you're using wires with connectors on them. If you're using bare right. wires, that doesn't... Uh, not such a problem. It's not a problem, but you always want to remember to heat shrink before you <laughs> solder down your wires because then you have no way to get it on, right. as I have done to myself <laughs> many times. So what we do is we sort of position it sort of in the right place, and then we get our handy heaterizer, which is our famous heat gun. Turn that on. And let's see, let it warm up a little bit. You know, you can use a hair dryer for this. Uh, the heat gun is best because it really is the hottest. Um, we also have desoldering stations that have heat guns on them that are good for this. Except if you use a desoldering station, you want to turn the temperature down, you know, probably into the 200, 200 range, one or 200 range. Uh, because if it's hot enough to melt solder, it's hot enough to make this stuff catch on fire. So you want to be careful about that. And you guys can see now that it actually has formed to the wire and you can actually kind of see that shape of the resistor in there. So, yeah. so heat shrink. Yep. Good, good tip. And while we're at it, I'm going to do the other one real quick. Uh, same thing, just cut off a little piece. Slip it over this particular connector. And as Tony said, um, these connectors are small enough where it's not really an issue, but if you're soldering to like a big connector, um, put the heat shrink on the wire first, and yeah, <laughs> then you won't feel like a fool later on. Sometimes it's a, often a think twice and cut once, or think twice and <laughs> solder once kind of or thing. Think, th think three times and just go home. <laughs> Okay. And come back at it tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. Everything looks better the next day. So go ahead and shrink that guy down. I'm kind of rolling it a little bit like a rotisserie to sort of heat all the sides. And that's about it. Cool. 
Sweet. So on the other side of these things where the LED plugs in, I basically just plugged the jumper wires in straight into the LED wires. Um, LEDs have two leads on them. Um, in order to tell which one is positive and negative, the longer one is positive and the shorter one is negative. There's also often a flat spot, although not on these. Mm. And um, people who know what's going on can also look inside them. This, the structure oh. of the inside, there's like a little cone in there. Um, you can tell that the, the part that the little chip rests on, the cup part, is, I, I'm pretty sure it's always the, the grounded side, but I'm not sure about that. If, if you guys out in TV land know, uh, write, write us in the comments. And one thing, uh, so as Mike was saying, the two legs on the LEDs are different, meaning you can't plug them in backwards, otherwise you're going to have a bad day. Uh, <laughs> so that means that the LEDs are actually polarized. So some components you can plug them in either way, like those resistors that Mike had added in line, those are not polarized, so you could connect either side of the resistor in either way, and it won't cause any trouble. Uh, however, LEDs are polarized, so you need to make sure that you plug them in the right way, otherwise you can either blow them up or they just don't work. Um, and then you don't have any blinking lights. <laughs> uh, cool. All right. So I've now plugged the LEDs into the other side of that uh, little MOSFET board. And so more or less the, the power and the control voltage come in one side, and the high power output comes out the other side. So that's all set there. Um, now what I'm going to do is plug in the SD card. And I did not bother to program up a separate SD card apart from what's in here. So I'm just going to grab the one that's in here. Well, turning it on, of course. Um, well, that took care of that. <laughs> so there's our little tiny SD card. So Mike, do you have to have any special file formats for using the MP3 ah, trigger? Excellent, excellent question, Tony. Um, the MP3 chip that's on the, uh, the board, uh, the VS-1053, knows a lot of different formats. It can play WAV files, it can play MIDI files, it can play um, AIF, AIFF files from a Mac, um, all kinds of things. All right. um, basically, you should go to the, the, um, the hookup guide <laughs> for the Lilypad MP3 Which player. Which we have pulled up here. On my has computer. a list on one of the last pages about what kind of file formats it can play. So it's actually, yeah, right down here, that supported audio formats. You click on that, and it'll go through that whole explanation for you, just like Mike said. And this has a lot more information on there. So, yeah. So. And as a side note, if you guys bought any of this stuff and then decide you don't want to build your own TARDIS box, um, we do have hookup guides for all the products. So if you just kind of want to see what other stuff people have used these things for, you can always go check out the hookup guide. And those are always linked uh, from the product page. So that's another good resource if you, know, you get lost in the tutorials on the Learn site. So. Cool. So I've plugged the SD card into the LilyPad MP3 player. Um, Always do that when it's turned off, um, just to prevent any files from getting corrupted on the, on the card. Oh, and if you, know, if you want to know what files to put on the card itself, in our repository on GitHub, uh, one of the directories in there is audio. And so I threw the three audio files that I'm using on it in there. So you can just drag those straight to your SD card and just throw it onto the box. And it basically, with the little adapter that our SD card comes with, um, it mounts just like a USB storage device, so you can just drag and drop your files on there. So. No, I pulled the lead off my oh, battery. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Dude. this isn't good. Let's see. So I, that right there, folks, try, is a good uh, example of why you want to put strain relief on your batteries. Yeah. Um, also, this is a good time to bring up LiPo battery safety. So yep. Mike is doing something that we generally discourage if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. But In fact, um, I may not end up doing this. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can try and fix your batteries if that happens, but sometimes you got to be careful that you don't end up shorting them together and puffing out your LiPo battery. Right. And if you do end up puffing your LiPo battery, uh, please make sure to dispose of it carefully and make sure it doesn't um, explode on you or anything because that can actually hurt you. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, lipo fires are nothing to sneeze at, definitely. Um, inside a lipo is a little circuit that's called a protection circuit. And um, that is there Keep to... Keep your knuckle in the way. Oh, <laughs> Can't get it to focus. Um, there we go. The protection circuit's in there to prevent... Um, like if you short-circuited the cell, um, theoretically it will sort of see that, that uh, too much current is going through it and sort of shut things off. Um, that's for these cells, which are, we sell, we're, they're designed for electronic projects. You can also get LiPo cells that are used for model aircraft mm -hmm. that don't have any protection circuit in there and are fully capable of dumping the entire current out of the battery on the order of minutes. Yes. Hundreds and hundreds of amps. If you guys want to see any cool videos of that, uh, we had, I think they got posted uh, a few weeks ago. Our engineer Casey was competing in some robot wars and had some pretty spectacular fires from batteries like that. <laughs> so uh, if yeah. you guys just want to check out some really cool robot fires or what can go wrong with electronic projects, you might want to check those out as well. Right. So. Okay, so I've peeled back the covering, not too far because you don't want to get it back to the cells. And you can see the little control board in there, maybe. And you can see where the black wire is connected, and you can also see where the red wire broke off right there. So what I'm going to try and do is just solder that thing on there. This may be the most exciting spark fun live ever. <laughs> Never a dull moment. Right. Actually, I can do that. This is what happens when you don't you throw the engineers off of their weekly schedule by making us have a meeting on Tuesday. <laughs> That's right. Yesterday was Memorial Day, so yes. we're, we're all kind of off a bit. Yes. So I've stripped off a little tiny bit of that wire, and what I'm going to do is tin it. And tinning is putting a little bit of solder. And normally I'd have a third hand for this sort of thing, but I'll see what I can do. Tinning has put a little bit of solder on the bare wires, which does a couple things. It, first of all, it glues all the wires together so they don't splay and touch other things. And the other thing it does is it gives you a little bit of solder kind of ready, ready for you to solder to whatever you're trying to solder to. That's great grammar. But um, I'm going to go ahead and just sort of very gently Put that where it's supposed to be, and see if I can't just tack it down in there. So that looks pretty good. And as Tony said, this is what happens when you don't strain relieve your wires. And this this other wire, I can sort of see that it's already starting to fail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo that one as well and do the same thing. Usually a good way for strain relief on your wires, if you know you're going to be mounting your battery somewhere, uh, maybe use a little bit of tape. You can always use a little bit of hot glue on the edges right where they connect mm -hmm. to the battery. Um, you can also, uh, if you have like Sugru or something like that, you can always use that. Um, you just want to stay away from anything that's really going to you know, could possibly melt the wires or eat through the battery or anything like that, but... Right. Um, okay, so now I'm going to try and tack this guy back down where it came from. And not burn myself or the building in the process. Yes. Okay. Speaking of burning the building, if you guys do build something like this, um, whether it's a TARDIS box or anything else, and you plan on mounting it somewhere as a prank, <laughs> Um, you may want to consider at least just putting a little bit of a note on the box or something saying that, uh, you know, with your name and number and just say this is a toy electronic or something like that. Um, yeah. We don't want to cause any unnecessary panic anywhere, so um, there's... Exactly. Yeah. Let's see. And if I had some tape, I would strain relieve this now, but I don't, so I'm just going to go ahead and plug you it in. do have hot glue, though. <gasps> I do have hot glue. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. So what do you think, Tony? Should I bend it back and glue it to the thing or just put some dabs of hot glue down there? I personally like to leave as much battery wire for myself as I can so okay. I don't end up yanking on it. Okay. Uh, so. so just kind of... Yeah, put I would it on just the end. cover it up there. All right. <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and just 
while you're doing that, I'm going to okay. check and see if anybody's asked us any questions. Oh, all right. Let's see. So we've got a few comments in here. Um, so uh, Carlos actually asked us, could sealing the resistor with heat shrink make it heat up and change the way it works? Um, I've heard of people melting resistors, but generally if you're working <laughs> with those kinds of temperatures, you're going to be melting a lot of other stuff before you get to that point. Uh, so if you're just using enough heat shrink, like we said earlier, you can use a hair dryer to do that. So um, most of these electronics can handle a couple hundred degrees before they really start baking. Um, obviously, if you're really unsure about that, you want to check the data sheet for some stuff. Uh, there's always going to be the absolute maximum in ratings in there and then the recommended range of uh, temperatures for your components, so double check that. Um, but generally, you should be okay just using your standard heat shrink gun. Um, if you are using a desoldering station with the hot air rework, that's when you might want to be a little more careful with that and turn the temperature down like Mike mentioned earlier. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, the, exactly. The temperatures we're looking at here really aren't high, to, high enough to damage the resistor. Um, and as Tony said, if you look in the data sheet all in the fine print down at the bottom, they'll usually say what kind of temperatures a yep. resistor can reach before it starts, starts changing its value. Um, unless it's a thermistor. That's, that's a different thing. So For another day. I am going to plug this into right. our LilyPad MP3. And just to check real quick, I will turn it on, see if we get a red light. Hey, we do. Good, good news. And now we are ready to program it. So if you are following along at home and looking at our GitHub repository, you'll see a whole bunch of code in there. Um, we've got some libraries that you need. This uh, board uses two libraries. It uses the SDFAT library. Um, which allows us to read files off of the SD card. And it also uses a library called uh, the SFE MP3 yep. player MP3. library. MP3 Shield. MP3 Shield library, yep. which was written by a guy named Bill Porter, who is amazing because it's a wonderful, wonderful library. It makes uh, this chip and this board <coughs> much, much easier to use than it would, would be otherwise. So yeah, again, that's on the GitHub repository. Um, if you guys are playing around with this at home and come across any bugs or anything like that or find anything, uh, any changes that would make the code better for everybody, you can always uh, send a pull request to us and we'll take a look at that and try and get it updated for the community. So, Absolutely. Um, and that goes for any of our repositories too, just to throw that out there, so. Sweet. Um, so I plugged my FTDI and my uh, USB cable into the board. Um, this board requires a <laughs> thank camera you, magic. This board requires a 5 volt FTDI, not a 3.3 volt FTDI. And the reason we do that is so that we can charge the battery. Uh, we couldn't charge the battery if we were using a 3.3 volt FTDI. And if you've noticed that yellow LED that's lit up on the board, that's the charging LED. Um, when the board is turned off and you put 5 volts into it, it will charge the battery until it's full. And um, it'll probably turn off after a few minutes. Um, you do have to have the board turned on in order to program it. Um, and when it's turned on, yeah. the red light turns on as well. And what we'll do now is go into Arduino and load right. our sketch. One thing to note before you load the sketch, though, yeah. uh, those libraries that we showed you in the yes. uh, Arduino or the GitHub repository, you do need to copy those into your library drive on your Arduino uh, program. So if you're not sure how to do that, we've got links in all of our tutorials as how to do that. So especially with the getting started with the LilyPad MP3 trigger, read through that initially, uh, maybe before trying to build this, if you're not sure how to copy those libraries in. Because otherwise, if you don't copy those libraries in and you go to compile your code, you end up with a bunch of error messages. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. It is frustrating. S super good point, Tony. Yeah. I've already got the libraries installed, so I just loaded up this sketch. And um, let's see, I will set the um, serial port for my FTDI, which is 13, that's correct. And I will set the board for Arduino Pro or Pro Mini 3.3 volt, 8 megahertz with Atmega 328. 
It's kind of a mouthful, um, but if you look at the, the guide, the, the readme in the repository, it also has instructions for this stuff. So now we're ready to go ahead and load up that code. So we'll compile it and see if it actually gets there without errors. And you can see the status on the bottom of the screen there. So it's as it's compiling all the code, it's going through that. Uh, yep. And the little, the little LEDs blink on the. There we go. And this it's is, this taken, is a big piece of code. Yeah, it's taken a while. So <laughs> if it's blinking like that, though, don't panic. It's still working. It's yep. just taken yep. a while. So. Yeah, those are actually really good blinks. And again, if it, if it doesn't work, remember to turn on the board first. You, you need to have the red light on and the board turned on in order to program it. Yes. OK, so done uploading. We've got our code on there. And let's see. What I'm going to do now is let's, let's play with speakers, because we sort of you know brushed that off. Um, normally, as Tony said, normally SparkFun sells really cool speakers. Yep. Um, unfortunately, a couple months ago, our supplier just kind of vanished off the face of the earth. So we're, we're looking for new ones, so sorry about that. But fortunately, speakers are easy to find. And um, we've, we've got a dumpster here at SparkFun where all kinds of stuff goes in, and I pull a lot of stuff out. We do but a lot of dumpster <laughs> diving ourselves before we send all the cool stuff to you guys. So, <laughs> But I went in and looked through there and got kind of this big pile of, of speakers. Um, old computer speakers are good. Um, sometimes you can even just, you know, they'll, they'll even have a wire on it. You can just use the wire, or you can open them up and get the speakers out. Um, old automotive speakers are cool. And, um, and something you know. to keep in mind with any of these bare wires, you can always solder uh, barreled or audio jack connectors to those. So yeah, um, and they're magnetic, if you want to have so something stick to each other. nice to plug in. Um, so yeah, speakers are not hard to find. Thrift stores, again, you can find like old computer speakers for a <laughs> buck. Um, just pick those up. And um, as advice, uh, SparkFun does sell some tiny speakers. Um, we sell this little teeny guy. Um, we also sell... It's in here. There he is. Yeah. Yep. So All of our magnets stuck in. Yeah, all these guys. Yeah, so we got that little guy. So these guys are really good for small projects or things that'll be close to your ear, but they're not very loud for something that you want to really make a lot of noise. And what we found is that the larger the speaker, uh, the better things work. <laughs> so, and it doesn't matter if this is like a 100 watt speaker or you get one that's like, you know, 16 inches across or something, which would be really cool. Um, as long as it's, um, Anywhere between 4 ohms and 16 ohms on the back, mm -hmm. the, the amplifier on the Lilypad MB3 can deal with it. So, Again, that's a, another thing. Just make sure you try, try and figure out the ratings for the speaker if you're um, hacking it out of something else before you just hook it up to your board, just to prevent blowing it up. Um, Another thing that you could also use instead of speakers, you, if you are going to be mounting this into oh, yeah. something, uh, you could actually use a surface transducer. Uh, so what those do is they basically vibrate against the surface and they actually turn uh, a desk or if you're going to have this in a hat or something that's going to be on someone's head, you can actually use their skull and that turns that into an amplifier. So, um, And the neat thing about that is if you are using it, for example, in a hat, the only person who can hear it is the person wearing it uh, instead of anybody um, anybody else so yeah uh, Mike's got that pulled up there yeah. so um, yeah like Tony said the surface transducer is really really cool because yeah. you just set it down on a table and all of a sudden the whole table turns into a speaker yep and uh, it might actually be really cool for this because if you want something that's sort of mysterious and you can't really tell where the sounds coming from that would be a really yeah. good option we may or may not have used those a few times on the boss's <laughs> office when he's been gone on vacation yep uh, to drive him crazy with yep. various versions of Disney songs, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we do love our Pete. And our pranks. And our pranks. So a fun way to try out speakers with a lily pad is to just use uh, alligator clips and clip them onto the speaker terminals. So let's see. If you look down here, um, it says right speaker underneath the, uh, the, M, the, the SD. SD card. Thank you. So you can just clip right onto those and clip onto your speaker. And I don't know if it's making noise right now. It might be. Let's see. 
me turn it off and on and see if that starts it back up. Could it possibly need to calibrate your accelerometer? <laughs> uh, let's see. Maybe. So the way the code works, and we'll go through this later, is it, it does an, a calibration step, um, which is where it sort of sits still for a few seconds and takes a bunch of measurements to see where the zero line is. And then after that, it uses that to actually compute when it's going to turn on. And the reason that you need to calibrate your accelerometer, uh, as we were saying earlier, you can use these in different applications. And there are different accelerometers that have different rating ranges on them for what they can read. So some accelerometers only read up to 1 or 2 Gs. Uh, some can read up to 250 Gs. And uh, if you're using something with like this, which is just going to be basic motion, um, not necessarily something that's going to be you know, in a rocket or uh, a high-speed collision type thing. If you're using it on a robot or something like that, or in a free fall, uh, you're going to want a more precise accelerometer, which is why you're going to want one th with lower ratings. But they do need to calibrate themselves, because um, you can actually have slightly different acceleration readings, depending on where you are elevation-wise. So it does change ever so slightly. Um, so it's just like how you would weigh something differently on, at different heights, uh, at different elevations on the planet. Your acceleration also reads slightly differently. So. Okay. Mike's got this hooked up here now? Actually, not oh. quite yet. No. Um, so the other thing that's in the code, which we'll go through here in, at some point pretty quick, yeah. is um, it has sensitivity values. And so the sense, it, it basically has numbers in there that tell it how sensitive you want it to be. Do you want it to just go off when you even tap a little bit on the table, or do you want the whole elevator to really move up and down? So it's not actually triggering at this point. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to make those numbers a little bit smaller and see if that helps. And that also can be a feature sometimes, depending on the accelerometer you're using. Some specifically have the feature known as tap detection. Some don't. Um, some are just really basic analog sensors that just spit out values. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, I believe, it, it works over I2C. Yep, this so, is an I squared C. Yep. Yeah, and accelerometers have different ranges. Um, I've set this one to the lowest range, which is plus or minus 2 Gs, which makes it the most sensitive to the smallest yep. motion. But um, we do have, or it, probably not on the storefront yet, the 250 G. We used to have one, and then we're getting a new replacement coming out soon. So we're actually just trying to figure out of some good ways to actually test that 250 G range, which gets a little bit harder than you think without massive destruction of property. So. Um, Okay, so it's doing a new calibration. All right. And let's see if. Happy with the looking lights? Yeah, and you can tell it's playing because it's pulsing the blue lights, which is part of the, the whole TARDIS thing. So we'll go ahead and hook up our speaker and see if we can hear it. And like I said, using alligator clips, if you got a whole bunch of speakers on your, your run to the thrift store, um, this is a good way to try them out. You can also hook up a few different ones together, but again, just make sure you don't change that resistance and uh, end up going above what the amplifier chip on the board can handle. Right. Oh, still, still nothing down there. Could that be a bad speaker? It could be a bad speaker, or it could be bad code. It could be a lot of bad things. I wonder if it's bad code. Let me make sure I turned on the amplifier. Because you can turn the amplifier on and off in order to save power. And you might ask yourself, well, why didn't you see this earlier when you were testing all this stuff? And the answer to that would be as I tested it with headphones and the headphones jack, I didn't actually hook up a speaker to this particular piece of code. And because it's demo day curse, <laughs> as always. Let's see, so turn the <coughs> amplifier off. Um, turn it on. Do you want to just walk through the code now? 
we'll work sure. on debugging it as we go. Sure, sure. All right. And if they, you guys do have any questions about powering your project or anything like that, we do also have a bunch of tutorials on the Learn site for that as well. Um, I've got one pulled up right now, just a general how to power your project. Uh, so again, if you guys you know have any questions more general than this, or if this inspires you to build something else really neat and blinky or noise making or you know good prank machine, um, you can always check those out. And if we don't have a tutorial up that you need, let us know. Shoot us an email. Send us a tweet. Facebook us somehow get in touch with us. So we're here to help you guys learn. So <laughs> yep. Let's see. So I just plugged in headphones and we'll see if that does anything. Yeah. Yep. So the headphones are working. Um, you can probably hear hear my voice saying, uh, "Getting ready to calibrate." So let's. Calibrate. Yeah. So now it's calibrating, and we'll do that for a few seconds. Then when the lights go off, it's calibrated. And now when we move the accelerometer, it should start up TARDIS noise. And you can hear the TARDIS noise. So that's through headphones. We're, we haven't gotten the amplifier quite working yet, but uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. And uh, yeah, let's start rolling through the code right. and uh, see what's in there. OK, whoops, there we go. So, damn it, why can I not click there? There we go. OK, so like any good piece of code, this has all kinds of comments at the top with links to stuff and how to hook it up. Um, it lists the two libraries we're using. And um, down here, the first piece of real code we have are in includes, where we're including the libraries. Uh, we're including the SPI library, which we use to talk to the um, micro SD card. Um, the SD FAT actually reads the files off of it. Uh, the MP3 shield lets us talk to the, the MP3 decoder chip. And we need the wired library in order to talk to the accelerometer. So we've got all these libraries in there. Um, moving further down, um, these are a few of the pins on the Lilypad MP3 player that we'll be using. And instead of just putting like a 10 in your code and not quite knowing what that is, uh, we'd like to give them descriptive names. So instead of pin 10, we've got um, on, on the normal lily pad, this is the red LED on the rotary switch. It's a little bit cryptic, but um, that, that lets you tell exactly what the function is. And if you look in the schematic, you can also see these exact names on all the wires. So it's really easy to trace out. Um, then we go down the accelerometer stuff. I pretty much pulled this straight out of Nate's example code for this particular accelerometer. Um, one of the cool things about Arduino is if you have two pieces of code you want to mash together, you can just sort of mix and match and cut and paste and, yep. and make sure you're not sharing any of the same pins and eventually everything will be working OK. That also is a good reason to really name your pins descriptively. Um, yeah. If you are planning on mixing and matching or sharing your code with the community, it does end up helping that. So. Yep. Um, we've got a few global variables we're using for that pulsing blue light. Uh, we've also got uh, two times pi down there for reasons that will become clear in a little bit. And now the code proper starts. We create uh, library objects for the MP3 player and the SD card. And one thing I'm doing here is allowing debugging. If I open up a serial monitor, you'll see that it'll start printing out all kinds of little messages, which are kind of useful when you're debugging. But uh, you could turn that on and off if you want here. You could make this false, and it won't print out anything. And the reason we're doing that is because the serial port actually uses two of the, the pins that are kind of on the edge of the Lilypad MP3. So if you're using serial, you can't use those for anything else. But if you turn off serial, you can use those for other things like triggers or something like that. So You could also have this hooked up to some other sensors if you wanted to add this into a costume or something like mm -hmm. that, um, or make it interactive that way. Uh, so Yeah, the, it's, a, it's a really versatile board. It's good, it's good for all kinds of things, not, yeah. not just silly pranks. Uh, although it's very good at that, too. So moving on, uh, here's our setup. We, uh, if we're debugging, we turn on the, the serial port. 
we set up our I.O. pins for inputs and outputs and give them the initial um, settings, whether we want them high or low. Let's see, same thing down here. Uh, now we initialize the SD card. Uh, this is a function in the SD card library, sd.begin, and you give it some parameters. Um, more or less, this is code that you can cut and paste for your own stuff. Um, if there's a problem initializing the card, I put in a feature where it will blink, like repeatedly. It'll, and it'll blink different numbers of times. It'll either blink once and then pause a while and then blink once, or it'll blink twice and then pause a while and blink twice. And that's so if you don't happen to have the serial monitor window, you can still get some idea of what's going on or what, what's wrong. And that's also, I was just going to say, that's a, if you are borrowing someone else's code, that's usually a good reason to read through the code before you start powering <laughs> things up. A lot of times there will be neat little features in the code that you don't know otherwise. So, um, and usually they're built in to be helpful to you. Yeah. In fact, we could probably show that. Let's see, I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to unplug the SD card, and I'm going to turn it back on. And let's see what happens. So the lights turn on. And... Yeah, now it's blinking once kind of forever. And if you look through the code, you would know that blinking once is the error code for something's wrong with the SD card. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a handy little feature. Mm -hmm. So moving further down, the next thing we do is we initialize the MP3 player. Um, we get another begin function. Usually in libraries, there will be a begin that you'll have to do first. And again, we're going to check that. And if it worked OK, um, cool, and if not, we'll do another error code, another number of blinks, and stop. Um, now that we have those things working, we're setting the volume. You, the MP3 player chip has a volume control built into it. Um, oddly enough, 0 is the maximum volume, and 2 of 55 is the minimum volume. Um, I'm setting it to 10 here, which is pretty darn loud, um, but you can set it to whatever you want. Um, and you, a cool yeah. thing about the lily pad board is, too, that you can also add in a rotary encoder onto the board if you want and actually add in a volume dial or a track selector or something like that. So again, just another way you could modify this project to make it your own uh, or change the prank or whatever you wanted to do with it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's see. Moving on, I turn on the amplifier, which may be our problem. We'll come back to that. Um, then I deal with the accelerometer. Um, Turn on the wire library, which gives us the I squared C port. I squared C is this kind of crazy serial protocol that uh, sensors use to talk to computers. Mm -hmm. um, it's normally very difficult to use, but the wire library that's built into Arduino makes it pretty easy. So if you've never tried it, I highly recommend it. Um, again, we check, and if there's something wrong, we can do another error code. This time, it blinks three times if there's something wrong with the accelerometer. Um, then if everything did work right, we'll blink once. And if you look down at the function, false means don't do it forever. Just blink once and, and keep going. Um, so one blink is good. That means everything's going OK. Um, then we do the calibrate step. Uh, if we're debugging, we announce that we're going to calibrate in 10 seconds. And actually, I put, since we've got the MP3 player and we can play things, I also put something in there that says you know, we're going to calibrate in 10 seconds. Calibrating in 10 seconds. So another stupid, nope. stupid computer trick. Um, then we delay uh, 10,000 uh, milliseconds, <laughs> which equals 10 seconds. And then we start calibrating. Um, what we're doing when we're calibrating is we're just reading the accelerometer 5,000 times, looking at the Z, the Z uh, value. Um, and Z refers to the Z axis. Right. So yeah. depending on the kind of accelerometer you get, some are one axis, some read two axis, some are three axis. Uh, this one is a three axis. This is a three axis. Yeah. So we are only want to pay attention to the Z uh, axis, which is basically the straight up, straight and, up down. and down. Straight up and down. So yeah. that way, if you happen to be putting this into an elevator that shakes back and forth <laughs> side to side, which would be really horrifying, yeah. uh, it's not going to screw up your calibration. Yeah. Or, so. or Willy Wonka's elevator Ooh. that goes in all the directions. No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, and if, if you get an accelerometer and you look at the little red board, um, we've printed on there. I don't know Try if you can get that. that. Let's give it a shot. We usually print on there what, what all the individual directions are. Focus doesn't want to work. Let me 
picture of this. Oh. Uh, there you go. Oh. Okay. Almost. Oh. <laughs> Yay, cameras. live television. Yeah. yeah, cameras are smarter than us. Okay. There we oh, go. Nice. So, so you yeah, see on right the right there. hand side of that red board, we've got X, Y, and Z with some different arrows. And Z is actually a dot, which means it's pointed straight down. Yep. So, yeah. So that, that tells you what the axes are on our boards. And if you have any questions about that, go talk to anyone in a first year physics class. They'll tell you <laughs> all about it and probably more than you'd ever want to know. Yep, exactly. Um, so what we're doing when we're calibrating is we're looking at the Z value. We're doing this 5,000 times, just reading as fast as we can. And if we're, what we're looking for is the maximum and the minimum. And this is while it's sitting really, really still. So theoretically, it should be at zero Gs at that point. I'm sorry, at one, one G pointing straight down. So and that's because it's reading gravity. It's reading, reading the force of gravity down through, through, through the board. So we'll hold it really still, and it takes a bunch of readings, and then it measures the highest one that it got. It remembers the highest one that it got and the lowest one that it got. And that's sort of your range of what 1G is. And there's going to be a little bit of noise in there. Mm -hmm. um, Just like your graph earlier showed? Yeah. I'm, I, I won't bring that back up again. But uh, you can see it was kind of a, a, a noisy little okay. line in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so once we know that, we'll know where the 1G is, and we know to measure outside of that in order to see if something actually happens. Because yeah. if we measure it inside that, we'd just be getting triggers all the time. Exactly. So we, we find that. Um, just for fun, we print out what the min and the max is, and then we're done with the setup, and we can go to the loop. So the loop is what runs over and over and over in Arduino, as you guys know. And the first thing we do is we say what our sensitivity is and our samples are. Uh, the sensitivity number is how far outside that range you want to actually sample. So you've got sort of this dead zone in the middle you don't want to stay in. And then we've got a little bit of safety buffer. And then anything above or below that safety buffer, that's what's going to trigger, yep. trigger one of these readings. Uh, now samples is an extra step we've got on top of all that. Um, Part of the thing you'll notice with an accelerometer is that it'll measure all kinds of little bumps and shocks, and if somebody you know, hits the table, you'll get a really quick, sharp shock. And in the elevator, when people are going in and out and stuff, you'll get that as well. Or when the doors close. Yeah, or all, all kinds of stuff happens. But what we want to measure, what we want to test for is sustained acceleration. So what the samples value does in the code is it says, <coughs> I want to measure outside that, that dead range, but I want to measure that however many times in a row before I'm sure that the elevator is actually moving up and down. It's basically a double check on the accelerometer, whether to see if it was just noise or a sudden spike, or mm -hmm. if that is actually indicative of motion in the elevator. Yep, exactly. And, and these values are right up here, so you can fine tune them yourself. Um, it'll probably be different for everything. Um, but you, you can change them and play with it and see what works best. And I will unplug that so it stops making noise. <laughs> um, so further down, we actually read the acceleration out of the accelerometer. Um, this gives us all three values, x, y, and z, in an array called Excel. But we only want the z value out of that array. And arrays in computers count from 0. So the 0 one is x, the first one is y, and the second one is z. So what we're saying is z equals accelerometer, Excel array subscript 2. So that's how we pull out the z. Um, now we check that uh, sensitivity value. So we say if it's, if it's less than the minimum minus the sensitivity or greater than the max plus the sensitivity, so we're getting outside that dead zone, then we can increase the count. So the count is what we're checking to see how many times in a row and, mm -hmm. until we can really be sure that the, ele the elevator is actually moving up. And not that one of the dogs got loose in there. Right, which happens a lot. Um, and if we don't see something outside that dead band, we just go ahead and reset count to zero. So count's always kind of going up a little bit, but then heading back to zero. But if count actually gets high enough to get above that samples value, then we know that the, the elevator is actually moving up or down. So at this point, 
um, we start playing the noise and we actually do a little check beforehand because we don't want to keep starting it interrupting itself so if it's already playing if it's not already playing the exclamation point here means not so if the mp3 player is not currently playing then go ahead and play that track and that's that's the file name we've given it on the SD card and if you guys write your own code and want to use a different noise or a different file you can certainly change this to whatever whatever your file is yep. uh, we also do a little step here to reset the the pulsing blue light uh, back to its sort of starting condition um, so that's all we have in there as far as playing the noise it, it'll play in the background until it's over and that's one of the amazing things about uh, Bill Porter's mp3 library mm -hmm. is it does all this stuff in the background you don't have to keep feeding data over and over and over from the SD card over to the mp3 chip it, it just does it all by itself which is way way cool yeah um, so that that's as simple as it is for playing the noise uh, we're going to call a function that does the blue light thing, just because I didn't want to put all that mess of stuff in, in the big loop. Um, we use a delay 10 on the end just to kind of slow down the loop. And that's the end of, of, of that loop. Um, you, you, you look at the accelerometer, you see if it's outside the dead zone, you see if it's outside the dead zone for enough time to verify that you're actually really moving up. And if that happens, then you go ahead and play the noise. There you go. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the thing that pulses the blue light. And this gets really math intensive, so I'm glad that Tony's here <laughs> to help me out because she is a math goddess. Um, so basically, uh, I guess a good starting point on this is um, the short version of what Mike is doing on to run these LEDs is he's uh, modulating the pulse width on these, and that's what gives it that nice fade in and out. Um, so, and that's a really common thing. Uh, there's a lot of example code. That's, I think, one of the first example sketches that most people learn on Arduino when they're first starting with the Hello World blinking LED thing. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And Mike has a nice little graph pulled up there. The way that he's generating the values in the code for the LED blink is by actually using a sign function. So uh, don't worry, it's not trig class. Don't start having <laughs> flashbacks. I know that's a scary thing for a lot of people. Um, but he's got that nice graph there with the sine and cosine. You could do it with either one. Um, I don't know if there was a particular reason Mike picked sine function over Actually, cosine. technically, I picked the cosine function because the cosine starts at zero, ah, yeah. and the, the sine function starts halfway up. And because the cosine starts at zero, that makes it really easy to kind of start with the LED all the way off and uh, turn it on uh, yeah. from zero rather than kind of starting it halfway on. Gotcha. Uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> see if it can blink. Yeah. So. And yeah, you see that nice fading in and out. Um, and basically what it does is it just, for that pulse width modulation, it's basically um, f changing to a different value for uh, 0, which is all the way off, all the way up to 1024? Um, or 255. 255. Yeah. Ah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so, um, and then it's just basically creating that nice sine function gives it that nice smooth mm -hmm. transition from on to off, and then kind of gives it that nice uh, fading in and out. So yeah, I think you can show that in the code now. Okay, cool. Um, so we've got a value we're calling intensity, which is actually going to be the zero to 255 that the, the LED will have on it. Um, so, when you're doing a sine wave, what you do is you give it a number that is the number along the bottom here. And let's see, it actually, let's see. This, this chart's kind of weird because it's also on the negative side. But uh, you go from 0 to 2 times pi is one entire wave. And so we basically have a variable that starts at zero and it just slowly counts up and when it gets to two pi we start it over at zero again because those are the same values and there won't be any, any interruption in the wave so it basically comes down here goes up st and starts over and goes down and goes up and starts over and goes down and co goes up um, 
And those values are actually globals. They're a bit further up here. We've got one called blue wave, and we've got one called blue envelope. And I'll show you blue envelope in a minute here. But blue wave is the one that starts at zero and um, just kind of keeps ticking up. Um, now we're adding it. We're adding 0.05 each time we go through the loop, and that's kind of an arbitrary number. If and that controls the speed of the pulsing. Um, if if we made that number larger, it would pulse faster because it's moving through that sine wave faster. If we made it smaller, it would pulse slower. Um, so you can play with these values. Um, and if you want to, if you're you know playing with this at home and don't have any hardware, uh, you could probably hook this up with processing and kind of see just mm -hmm. how that graph changes, how you can change those values, sure. either speed up the yeah, cycle yeah. or slow it down, anything like that. So mm -hmm. there's different resources if you want to play yeah. around with that and don't necessarily have the hardware. Yeah, you you could even do this with the the LED built into the Arduino. Is I that one so. on a PWM? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so we've got one other thing in here called blue envelope. And what that's for is <laughs> to start the pulsing at kind of a low level and then gradually make it go higher and higher and higher and higher. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know if I can show it here. Maybe when it starts over. Right now it thinks it's, it thinks it's playing the noise. Yeah. So it starts off slowly and a little bit brighter and then a little bit brighter after that, and then a little bit brighter after that. So it's kind of like we've got two things going on here. We've got the sine wave, and we've got this thing that's at first squishing it way down to zero, and then sort of letting it kind of open up. So that's what blue envelope does. And blue envelope starts at zero, and we keep adding 0.02 to it every time we go through the main loop. And again, that controls how quickly it will, it will get brighter. Um, and we don't want it to go higher than halfway. For, for weird math reasons, but they're not weird math reasons. It's just, it's just the way things work out. Um, the envelope is, is halfway from 0 to 255. So if it gets up to 127, we don't want it to go any further. So we leave it at 127. Um, now I'm, I'm going to skip a little bit and say that the intensity is the cosine of the blue wave value uh, times negative 1 to flip it over. Um, that's because. The cosine actually starts at 1 here, but if you flip it over, it'll start at 0. And uh, then we're multiplying it by the blue envelope, and we're also adding it to the blue envelope. So this will kind of start at 0 and, and just start kind of getting bigger and bigger until it takes up the whole 0 to 255. Um, so that's what we use to compute the intensity. And then down at the bottom, we just do an analog write to that uh, IO port and that intensity. Now we're doing something a little bit crazy in here. Getting crazy. Getting with the crazy, math. I know. And um, that is that when you're playing this audio clip, the audio clip's going to end at some point. And the audio clip doesn't really have anything to do with the blue LEDs. They're kind of all they're both running independently. Mm -hmm. So when the audio clip ends, the LEDs will still be on at some level, and we want to deal with that. We want to turn them off, but we don't just want to turn them hard off. That, that wouldn't look good. That doesn't yeah. look like the TARDIS at all. So what we want to do is, wherever they are, we want to just fade them down to zero and then keep them at zero until the next time we need to you know, play that noise. Yeah. So what we're doing is, the first thing we check is, is the MP3 player still playing? And that will be true as long as the, the MP3 library is actually doing that audio file. Yeah. And if it is, we compute the intensity and just go along with our life as normal. Otherwise, if we're not still playing in this else, and the intensity of the LED is still on, it's still somewhere that we need to fade it out, what we're going to do is compute the intensity as normal until that gets down to zero, because this will fire when it gets to zero, and we'll do the else. And at that point, it just forever leaves intensity at zero. So this is one of those things where the logic's a little bit hard to follow. <laughs> Sometimes you need to trace through these things and sort of uh, watch things happen, or put variables in your code and yeah. watch them print out numbers and stuff like that. But uh, it, it works out pretty well. Um, it, it plays the TARDIS noise. Yeah. It blinks the LED. 
Um, at the end, when the TARDIS noise ends, if the, L if the LEDs are still on, it'll just continue on that sine wave until it gets down to zero point, and then it'll just stop and, and freeze it there. So, so that works out pretty good. Um, whoops. It is 4.30, which is when we were supposed to end. Uh, we didn't quite get the speakers working. Uh, we'll... If you want to try... I think we got a few minutes. Before. Got a few minutes to kind of poke around at it? Yeah. Okay. Since we started late on you guys. Yeah. Um, apologies for that. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at another piece of code which is the actual lily pad mp3 demonstration sketch and i want to make sure that i'm turning on the amplifier the way i think i should be oh. and uh ali brought up in the uh chat room they were asking if maybe we should try the left channel of the lily pad because it was oh. possibly a mono mp3 um actually went that's and checked that point. for us and it wasn't so it was <laughs> a stereo file but that's cool uh something to keep in mind you know um especially if you're using different file formats or anything like that um something simple like that sometimes can be just what's causing the problem for you yeah so um always double check that always make sure that you don't have a typo in the file name uh especially if you named it one thing on your sd card and your code says something different That'll cause problems. Usually that should throw an error, though, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing that happens sometimes <coughs> is you just get a bad alligator. Clip. Yep, sometimes and those do. What we do, let's see, hopefully this works. Yeah, the battery's good. Okay. Power. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Former this tech is, support. This is why I keep her around. <laughs> um, so let's see, we want the... Breaking out the trusty multimeter, always yeah. a good tool to have. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I've got uh, continuity, you know, and continuity means that if the two leads are connected, you get a, a obnoxious, buzzing, obnoxious noise. buzzing noise. If they're disconnected, you don't. And so that's a really good way to check electrical connections. It's good to see if you have a connection, for example, like what Mike's doing on a wire, and it turns out we don't. Uh, so that was our problem right there. <laughs> It's also good to... Excuse me a second. <laughs> That's what we do with those. It's also good to uh, use that continuity test to uh, check for shorts if you have two things connected that shouldn't be, for example, VCC and ground. So there we go. Hey, that's what's supposed to happen. All right. <laughs> you should check your black wire too, yeah. Way ahead of you. <laughs> Because we don't want to be here till midnight, and I know you don't either. <laughs> All hey, right. Okay. Let's, <laughs> Let's make the magic happen. <laughs> of course, sometimes problems stack up, and you, you only need you need to solve them one at a time until you actually get to the end. Yep. <laughs> So let's see. So Mike's going back to clipping those onto the speaker channels on mm -hmm. the lily pad board there. Yep. And I actually have not tried this speaker before, so this will be entertaining. <laughs> um, speakers technically don't have a polarity, um, so you could hook them up either way. But if you hook up two of them, try to hook them up the same way. There we go. Wow. So yeah. <laughs> One bad so, wire. One bad wire and one really trashy speaker, but you still get a real good noise out of that. It's pretty loud, isn't it? Yeah. And that's only one. We could hook up the other one and, and have twice the fun. Um, I don't know if I have enough working extension cords. Yeah. <laughs> and it's going to keep playing because I got my. Have the sensitivity so high. Yeah, I have the sensitivity high. Yeah, can you hear me over there? <laughs> Let me change the sensitivity and... So now that we have a working uh, <laughs> demo here, the next thing is going to be, well, what do I mount this in? Obviously, you don't want your uh, project just kind of bouncing around like this, especially if you're just using these jumper wires. For example, you just pull one out like I just did. Yeah. So, sorry about that, Mike. It's all right. Um, <laughs> but, so what Mike showed you guys earlier, the original yeah. demo we had, we had this hooked up in one of our classic red boxes. Um, he had different speakers that he used in here, but you can see cutout holes here, and then for the LEDs. Um, 
and then did some nice mounting with the accelerometer in, you know, there we go. Yeah, did some nice mounting of the accelerometer in here. So um, right there you can see it's mounted with those, uh, some screws and some standoffs to the uh, to the box so that way it's a little bit more stable so you don't get quite so much of that um, noise and then just use hot glue to mount everything in here including the battery so and again you can see that extra wire on the battery so we're not straining the wires yep. so um, we have a few red boxes here that we've got uh, we could cut up um, alternatively if you guys have something at home you want to use uh, you could put this in a wooden box or <laughs> lunch box a lunch box yeah, yeah. lunch yeah, box yeah. are always good we, we love lunch boxes um, here. yeah yeah. Christmas stocking for some reason. If you wanted to make a Doctor Who Christmas stocking. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You guys used the Lilypad MP3 in the Krampus Christmas yep. stocking, didn't you? Yep. So similar yeah. idea. Um, different reaction to the external world, mm -hmm. though. So. And, and once you have everything kind of working on your desk and, you know, you can tape stuff down as well to make sure that it doesn't move, then, you know, it's pretty easy to transfer that in, into a case or something like yep. that. Although sometimes it's good to wait on that in case you end up uh, trying to mount this into a box that you realize, you know, your wires for your LEDs are just too short to get them where you want them. So again, that's, you know, usually good to, uh, th again, measure twice before you cut into your <laughs> box or permanently glue anything down. Uh, especially if you're using hot glue, you can usually get it off well enough to change things around, but it, yeah. it can become a problem. So, um, or you just end up gluing everything together and then want to give up. So, cool. So right. what I'm doing is I'm re-uploading the code with some new sensitivity values, mm -hmm. um, and when the code actually starts working, the first thing it's going to do is, if if everything works right, is it's going to say that it's going to calibrate in ten, in ten seconds. Yep, calibrating in ten seconds. So kind they can sit there and wait. Probably sound like a Terminator that. through that thing, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Not used to you sounding so terrifying. Uh, while the while the LEDs are on, it's 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 measuring the value, and I'm actually holding it down here on the table. Uh, once it's calibrated, which it is now, um, it's all all done. And so theoretically, if I move the accelerometer enough to trigger it, oh, I love you might this not be part. moving oh, it. There we go. Long enough. That's true. That's totally true. So remember, you have those ten counts, and yep. uh, specifically to brief. avoid. Yeah, yeah. So. And you can see that the LEDs will, after the sound leaves, it'll just fade out and uh, reset for the next time. And let's try it one more time. Right. There we go. <laughs> All uh, right. And um, as, as Tony said earlier, um, this is one you want to be careful with. Uh, you know, SparkFun's the sort of place where, you know, if people find weird boxes in the elevator or robots roaming around in the hallways or just circuit boards with batteries and wire, hope, that, that's Tuesday. That, that's a normal day for us. It's true. Um, everywhere else in the world, because of terrorism and because of the response to terrorism, law enforcement take these things extremely seriously. Like um, our friend Star Simpson got in really ridiculous amount of trouble for basically showing up at an airport, not even going through security, just showing up to pick somebody up, just wearing a shirt with some electronics in it, which we do here all the time. Uh -huh. um, so hopefully things will get better in the future and, you know, but, you know, don't, don't get in trouble. <laughs> Listen to your Uncle Mike. Yeah. <laughs> and especially if you plan on putting this into a building, a feature such as an elevator, yeah. you know, maybe clear it with your facilities, guys. Like I said, um, we get yelled at a lot by our facilities managers for burning things we shouldn't or blowing things up when yeah. we shouldn't or anything like that. He's, he's an incredibly good sport considering all the it's stuff true. we put him through. It's true. Yeah. So, right on, Jesse. <laughs> Um, and Garrett. Be before we go, we had a few more questions pop up in the code here, cool. Mike. Um, yeah. Carlos asked, Mike, you mentioned that some of this code may be hard to follow. Do you guys know of any source level debugging solutions for Arduino code? Ooh, ooh, that's a really good question. Yeah. I don't, but I've also not been looking for that sort of thing. I okay. understand the new Arduino from Atmel. What's the name of that guy? Do you remember? 
the Zero? Yeah, yeah. The Arduino yeah. Zero will apparently have like a JTAG port or, or something on oh, it. So that's right. you can actually, you know, set breakpoints and step through code and stuff like that. That's that's sort of more at the assembler in well, I guess the compiler will bring it up to the source level. It's it's complicated. But um, hmm, that that's a really good question. I I have not seen a real good solution to that, but Typically, Arduino programs are simple enough where you, you stick an LED that turns on at a certain yeah. time, you use the serial debugger out to your, your monitor window. Um, you can always also, you know, take the Arduino code and export it out to AVR Dude and um, go that way true. with it. So totally. it gives you a little totally. bit more of an option for that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a whole other program for how to do that, though. So yeah. I don't think we can. Hopefully, we'll see more of that in the future. Yeah. I think it would really help a lot of people. Oh. Any other questions? Uh, no, the only other comment was that it sounds like a T-Rex from here. <laughs> so, I think there is your next project. There we Forget go, the yes. TARDIS. Just put the. That's th there was rumors of another Jurassic Park. So you never know. We Whoa. might have to have some uh, giant dinosaurs. One, oh, well, another giant dinosaur running around here. <laughs> Wouldn't yeah. be the first time. Yeah. So, which is a good place to plug AVC. Ah, yes. <laughs> Uh, it's coming up, it's June coming 21st. Up. Yeah. Um, AVC is our annual robot race. Uh, we used to have it around the building here. You just had to get all the way around the building. I don't think the first year anybody actually made it around the building. Too many uh, GPS dead spots. Yeah, so. um, but the next year people were better. Next year people were unbel unbelievably fast at it. Um, then we added aerial vehicles. And now it's so big, we can't do it here at our building. We have to do it uh, a couple miles away at the Boulder Reservoir. Yep. Um, it will be broadcasting it live. So anybody who's not here in Colorado, you guys are still going to be able to tune in and watch it. Uh, Mike will be running the camera, so I promise it'll be a lot less shaky than when I was doing it. <laughs> um, it it's going to be a great time. So yeah. um, if you come, are local. Come here yeah. if you can. It's a great time. We have a couple thousand people show up. It's um, free. Hundred robots ish, something like that. Yeah, so. it's it's really really fun. Um, you do have to sign a waiver in case any of the robots get loose. So just you know, if that's a consideration for you, yeah, keep that in mind. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, keep that in mind. Um, come out if you can. Watch on YouTube if you're remote. Um, Other than that, anything else? I think we're good. Sweet. Um, thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, Again, I'm Mike. I'm Tony, and we'll be posting more information for the next Spark Fun yeah. Live soon. Yeah, and as we say in Doctor Who, Klaatu Barata Nikto. Bye. I'll send him a hoodie.